1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and we're going to be uh, reading one verse uh, tonight as we uh, move in towards the Thanksgiving season, uh, a very familiar verse, but I think some truths here tonight that will help us uh, maybe put some things in perspective uh, with respect to life and all that's happening in our society with all of the shootings, the killings, the hatred, the argumentation, the hypocrisy, uh, the difficulty that we see and hear about every day, and yet in the middle of that, there's this verse, and we come to it, 1 Thessalonians uh, 5.18, and so every one of these verses is really a sermon, uh, but I want to just begin at, at uh, verse uh, number, uh, uh, verse number uh, 15, and then read down through verse number uh, 24 uh, for our reading time. So first, uh, first Thessalonians 5, 15. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit. By the way, folks, please don't do that tonight. When the Holy Spirit's working and speaking in your heart, don't quench the Spirit, but welcome the work of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And then despise not prophesyings. We need to hear the preaching of the Word of God. Many churches today are canceling services and revival meetings, and it's as if many Christians are saying, uh, you know, I don't really want to have prophesyings or preaching. But God says don't despise the preaching. Want the preaching. Amen. Welcome the preaching. And then prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. Remember what I said about social media and all the voices out there? Prove those things, test them. And then abstain from all appearance of evil and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who calleth you who, that calleth you, who also will do it. Well, let's pray, and we'll jump into this verse number 18. In everything, give thanks. Let's pray together. Father, throughout this year, there have been so many blessings, but there have been many trials and challenges. And so we come to you tonight, and we open your word, and you tell us, in everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And I pray that you would warm our hearts tonight and change our will that it might be more thankful. And Lord, that we would be a people leaving this place a little bit differently than when we came in. And with more gratitude in our hearts is my prayer. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. I've always loved the passage that we read just a moment ago from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 because it sort of reminds me of how I used to write letters and sometimes uh, maybe to Terry or maybe to some other loved one and maybe even to a church member and you kind of have the general body of the letter and then how many of you ever put a PS on a letter? You, you ever done that? And How many of you put a PS, PSS on the letter? You know? And how many of you then, oh yeah, and you put another one and another one and, and, and in no way am I saying that the Holy Spirit was just adding stuff that the Holy Spirit forgot, God doesn't forget. But there are a number of things at the end of this book that seem to just be admonitions that, as I said a moment ago, are just many sermons all by themselves, like we read often in the book of Proverbs. And what's amazing to me is that this church of Thessalonica that we read about here in 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians is often referred to as a model church. They were a church for, for whom the Holy Spirit said, from you sounded out uh, the word of the gospel all throughout Achaia and Macedonia. This was a church that had a, a prototype that was worthy of modeling after. And I believe one of the reasons that they were a model church is because I believe little things make the difference. I believe that God blesses a people, a pastor, a church that just tend to the little things, uh, to, the, to the little commandments of the Word of God. And here we see several little verses before us tonight. And one of those little things that is a characteristic of a model church is that it is a grateful church. It is a church filled with people still humble enough to say, 
God has been good to us. God has been good to me. And, and I want you to think about this because we're commanded here, in everything, give thanks. In everything, give thanks. Now, sometimes today in our culture, it seems like with all of the laws and with all of the threats against Christianity and, and uh, with uh, oftentimes children being told, you know, don't, don't read the Bible in school and, and teachers uh, being told, don't sing joy to the world, the Lord has come because that's against the law, you know, and, uh, you, and don't post the Ten Commandments. You wouldn't want somebody to obey the Ten Commandments. They might not kill if they you know, read the Ten Commandments or something. And so in this day where there's this removal of any semblance of Christianity, uh, it seems like many times people are hesitant in the public place to just say, thank the Lord or praise the Lord. It, it always refreshes me when I go to a military retirement and uh, hear some of our men give thanks to God or a retirement at a secular uh, workplace or maybe something like a retirement uh, a ceremony or even a dedication for a business and to hear members of our church just say I just want to pause and thank God for what he's done in my life it's refreshing it reminds me of the little fourth grade girl who wrote a little story about Thanksgiving she said the pilgrims came here seeking freedom from you know what when they landed they gave thanks to you know who because of this we can worship each Sunday you know where and uh, a, a lot of times that's kind of how generic it gets, you know. People are not specifically thankful to the Lord as they once were. I heard about a husband who gave his wife a beautiful skunk coat, and he laid it beside the Christmas tree. And when his wife opened it up, she said, I can't see how such a nice coat can come from such a foul-smelling beast. The husband said, I didn't ask for thanks, but I do demand some respect. So a lot of times we struggle with really living with the gratitude attitude. And I want to speak to you about it tonight. And, and this, this season, uh, besides being a biblical commandment, and we'll see many portions this month regarding Thanksgiving, I'm really glad I live in a country that actually has a month and a holiday set aside to give thanks. And I've often thought, what a frustrating day to be an atheist, Thanksgiving Day, you know? <laughs> I'm thankful that we know who to give thanks to, to our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is, this is kind of an amazing night for a couple of reasons. I've had to struggle for a grandchild's name, and, uh, and, and we're, uh, I've shared a few stories with you. And the other thing about this service tonight, it's going to be two points, not three. That's almost ungodly for me. <laughs> I may make up another one before it's over. I'm not sure. Uh, but just due to the whole circumstance behind this little short verse, I had trouble getting three points out of this verse. So... Uh, we're going to see two great thoughts, and then we'll be on our way. If you're taking notes, I want you to see, first of all, the command for thanksgiving. The command for thanksgiving. In everything, give thanks. Let's say that together, shall we? In everything, give thanks. Now, how many of you would say, Pastor, I have failed here a time or two? Anybody else, or am I the only one? I mean, I have to be honest sometimes, when, when a storm comes in like a flood and there is an incredible uh, moment of bad news or traumatic incident in our life, it's, it's a rare thing that we immediately give thanks. Normally we ask, why? How do we overcome it? You know, how could this happen? We often go through a series of things that that are the opposite of giving thanks. But we learn here that in everything we're to give thanks. So first of all, I want you to know from this verse that this gratitude attitude is to be continual. It is to be continual. In everything, give thanks. Uh, it is a continuous action that God is looking for. Uh, giving thanks is not something that is to be simply relegated to a holiday. Psalm 146, the psalmist said, while I live, will I praise the Lord. I will sing praises unto my God while I have any being. And I often use Dr. Siska as an illustration. I've been watching him since Virginia went to heaven, and I talk with him often, and I'm amazed that in the valley of the shadow of death, he still praises God. And it seems to me that oftentimes godly Christians who are going through great trials manifest the presence of the Lord with a giving of thanks to the Lord. And it's something that all of us should continually ask for. 
We live in a day of critics. By the way, they never have built a monument to a critic. We live in a day of analysts. We live in a day of, you know, you know Monday afternoon quarterbacks. Uh, we live in a day when everyone uh, has a complaint. A and yet God says, that's not what I want to hear from you continually. I want to hear thanksgiving continually. A and this, this is in everything, give thanks, whatever the circumstances are. And, and there's two ways that we can do that. First of all, we can do that with our lips. And the Bible says in Hebrews 13, 15, By him, therefore, let us offer sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. You know, I, I really believe that we as a church family need to make sure that at home that there is an attitude of gratitude in our home. I think little boys and girls need to hear moms and dads thanking the Lord. Amen. Thanking one another. Just literally, continually giving thanks. And it, it's something that is missing from our culture today. You know, uh, the average little boy, my name is Jimmy, gimme, gimme, gimme. <laughs> it's just really amazing to me. Sometimes I don't think we're grateful enough just for the small things. I often have told you at Thanksgiving time, my first Thanksgiving as a married man, I was working for Caterpillar Tractor Company. And I'll never forget when they gave us this game hen at Thanksgiving time. And a little note signed by the owner of the company. And, uh, and I was so excited about that game hen. And, and you can, you, you, I'm not just making this up. We rarely ate meat, Terry and I. We were Bible college students. We, we ate hot dogs on Sundays, but normally we had sandwiches and macaroni and cheese. That was kind of the staple of what we ate. And they gave us this game hen. And I just... I couldn't believe it. And uh, I, I, I went home. I was so proud to show it to Terry. Look what they gave me at work. This, this whole bird that we can eat. And a lot of the men at work were cussing. Ah, these people are millionaires. This is all they're going to give us. You know what I'm saying? Just, just like people that pick it for more, 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 more. And, and I'll tell you, I was so thankful and the longer that I live and the more that I lead and the more that I analyze budgets and study, I was looking today at just what it costs us to provide medical insurance for one family that works here. It costs more to provide medical insurance for a family in our ministry than I made for many years in the ministry. And, and yet many of you who have that type of a benefit are not thankful for it at all. Would probably not stop to consider that somebody's paying for that, and in most cases, it's the company where you work. Maybe you're paying for a little part of it. But I'm simply saying it's real easy to complain, but there's always something to be thankful for. And, and we just need to stop, and because the Bible says in everything, and with our lips. I mean, what would happen at work if just once in a while you just said to your boss, Hey, you know, thanks, thanks for uh, the opportunity to work here. Or thanks for what you taught us there. Or thanks for helping me out with this or that. And, and just giving thanks. I wrote a letter to, to Bill Anderson, who's, uh, who was my immediate uh, supervisor at work. And, and I put one in there for Bill Shepard, who was the owner of the franchise where I worked. And did you know that, that Bill Shepard, who was a multimillionaire, found me a few days later and he said, are you Paul Chappell? I said, yes, sir. He said, do you know that in all the years of giving out little things at the holidays, this is the first time anyone has ever said thank you to me? It, Thanksgiving has become that uncommon. And God says, I don't want it to be uncommon. I want it to be very common. I want it to be continually something that's from your lips. And, and you know, people complain about their chair at work, their office, their coworker. You know, if we took a poll tonight, someone would be too hot, too cold, too light, too dark. Who knows what, you know. <laughs> That's why we don't take polls. <laughs> but give thanks. I always tease the girls in my family, and there's, there's a growing number of them now. <laughs> I always say, you know, you always take note of when, it, when it's windy. But let's be thankful when it's at least not windy. And probably we should be thankful when it is as well, with our lips. 
I believe it was Charles Spurgeon who said, when we bless God for mercies, we usually prolong them. When we bless God for miseries, we usually end them. Praise is the honey of life which a devout heart extracts from every bloom of providence and grace. Isn't that a great quote? When we bless God for our miseries, he usually ends them. In fact, I, I, I really believe that oftentimes God, God allows a trial. We know that he will not try us above that which we are able, but he allows a season to bring us to a place of humility, to bring us to a place of really saying, Lord, I acknowledge your lordship, I love you, and yes, Lord, I thank you. And, and God will oftentimes just let something rest on us until we humble ourselves before him in that way. So with our lips. Another way that we give thanks is with our livelihood. And I'll just mention this briefly. Look at Hebrews 13, 16. But to do good and to communicate, forget not. Is that in your notes? All right, let's read that really uh, quickly. The whole verse, Hebrews 13, 16. But to do good and to communicate, forget not. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Now, communicate is not talking about Facebook. I'm sorry to disappoint you. Okay. Communicate is talking about giving. It's talking about expressing ourselves through giving. That's why it's called thanks. Come on, help me out. Thanks giving. Why? Because thankfulness is to be expressed. So when we talk to the Lord with our lips, we're expressing our gratitude. And when we give to the Lord in the offering time, we're expressing our gratitude. We're communicating. Uh, you see, uh, giving is a part of Christian worship. Now, I know the cynics, oh, they want is your money, it's all about money, blah, blah, blah. No, it's all about a heart that worships God. And one of the ways we worship is through communicating to God. And one of the ways we communicate is by giving. How many of you understand this, that uh, today, today was my wife's, this is a bad illustration, today's my wife's birthday. And due to the series of events, we've still not celebrated her birthday, except at 4.30 at the dirtiest Del Taco I've ever eaten at in my entire life. It was amazing. I, if I wouldn't have been starving half out of my mind, I would have walked right out of there. I wish I knew who owned that franchise. I have a good mind to, to counsel them on management and cleanliness. So this is a bad illustration about gratefulness, isn't it? I did give thanks to the Lord for the food. I want you to know that. And I gave thanks and I gave a track to the lady at the counter. But other than that, it was a, it was a bad situation. But Terry was grateful for that dinner. But how many of you know if I hopefully sometime in the next few days take Terry out for maybe a nice dinner or finally get the chance to give her a birthday gift? How many of you know that when I give something to her, that's communicating to her? It's communicating my love and my appreciation. So if, if I give something to Brother Furso or if I give something to Brother Reader or if I give something to a family member and it's communicating to them, why is giving not communicating to God? Amen. It is communicating to God. And don't you let some carnal, backslidden, non-tithing Christian take your joy away from communicating to God your thankfulness to God. Amen. So look at Philippians 4.15. Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. So God says, I want you to continually give thanks. In everything, give thanks. With your lips, with your, with your offerings, just have a gratitude attitude. It should be continual. And then secondly, it should be unconditional. And the reason that I say that is because it is an imperative command. It's an imperative command. Now, a lot of times people are like, well, you know, I'll be thankful for my job if they treat me the way they should. That's not biblical thanksgiving. You don't want a pastor that gives 100% only when everyone in the church is being so nice to him. It, it's not to be conditional. It, it's, it's a command, just like love one another. This command, in everything give thanks. It's an imperative command. Therefore, it is a command to always, through all circumstances, be thankful. Henry Ward Beecher said, a proud man is seldom a grateful man. For he never thinks he gets as much as he deserves. Isn't that a great statement? A proud man is seldom a thankful man. For he never thinks he gets 
as much as he deserves. So instead of waking up in the morning and doing what the power of positive thinkers say, you know, look in the mirror and tell yourself how successful you're going to be that day and all that type of thing, you might start the day off by saying, I am a sinner who deserves nothing but hell, and everything that happens to me today beyond that is a blessing from God. Because God says, I want you unconditionally to give me thanks for the goodness that I've bestowed upon you. It's an imperative command, and it is a constant command. It's in the present tense. In everything, give thanks. Tozer said, gratitude is an offering precious in the sight of God, and it is one that the poorest of us can make and not be poorer but richer for having made it. How many of you know that riches of the heart has nothing to do with the pocketbook? And a thankful man is a rich man. I've known some men and women who have a lot, but they don't have a thankful heart and they're miserable. And I've known some people who have so little, but they have a thankful heart and they're so rich. And this is what God is trying to teach us, that in everything give thanks. God wants us when the blessings come to give thanks. That makes common sense to us. James chapter 1 and verse 17, every, every good and perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. And, and we thank the Lord for that. It is far more important to pray with a sense of the greatness of God than with a sense of the greatness of the problem. In other words, when we pray, we know we're praying to the one who gives to us the many good blessings of our life. Psalm 145 and verse 3, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise thy works to another and shall declare thy mighty acts. And so we thank the Lord for his greatness and, and uh, for uh, his goodness to us in the blessings, in the blessed times, give thanks. Uh, folks, I can't stress to you how that so many of you, just the fact you're sitting here tonight, many of you are sitting with a spouse and you're saved and, and, and you're employed, how blessed we are. And, and I know sometimes you know, we want to make that next goal and we want to see that next victory and we want that next promotion. But sometimes we need to truly practice what the Bible says and learn to be content. Godliness with contentment is what? Great gain. Okay, so in the blessed times, but then also in the times of trials. In the times of trials, God says to give thanks. James 1, 2, brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations or different trials. Ephesians 5, 20, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Just whatever's going on, look for an opportunity to give thanks. Now, I have some weird habits in my life, and one of them is when I go someplace that has any history, I like to go to the graveyards. And uh, I just, I, I have learned a lot about history in graveyards. I remember standing in the graveyard at uh, uh, John Newton's church in Olney, England, and just what people put on those headstones is amazing. The verses, the testimonies, just to see how long some people lived, three days, three weeks, and then still praising God. Absolutely amazing. And we were, years ago, maybe 25 years ago, we were up in, way up in Fortuna, California. How many of you even know where that is? I knew the Rubers were going to raise their hands. I just knew it because you're longtime California residents. And they were like two of three people. It's up by the Redwood Forest, right, Brother Ruber? Fortuna, California. If, if, how many of you have been to the Sequoia National Forest? Let me see where you are. How many of you have been to the Redwood Forest? Okay, well, you've been near Fortuna. And Fortuna is actually an old Lutheran settlement. It's a dairy area in the midst of this uh, heavily forested part of our state. And when we were there, uh, I, I just kind of look up in a map or I'll, you know, look, when you pull into the city, read about the city. And it said it was founded by Lutherans way back in, you know, whatever, 1800s. And I said, oh, let's go to the graveyard. And all the kids said, yeah. <laughs> Ice cream or graveyard, you know. Okay, Dad, you know, so. And... Um, but we went there, and apparently there was some, uh, some sickness that came through that city. And the, these, uh, uh, these Lutherans, and long theological story, there's a, there's, a, there's a line of Lutherans that I believe actually did preach the gospel for a while, and the, some call them Missouri Synod or whatever. But uh, definitely you could tell from these tombstones, these people were trusting Christ. And, and yet we came to this whole row of tombstones, and... It was uh, just 
one little baby after another little baby. And it was sad. I mean, three days, ten days, things like that. And on one of those tombstones, here's the, here's the phrase that I read. We cannot, Lord, thy purpose see, but all is well that is done by thee. Can you imagine laying your baby to rest and having the spiritual heart to put that on the tombstone? We cannot, Lord, thy purpose see, but all is well that is done by thee. So even in their difficult moment, they're still praising God. They're still giving God glory uh, for being God, and they're still trusting in Him. So the command for thanksgiving covers the entire scope of human uh, interaction, relationship, ups and downs. And I just want to encourage you today with your spouse, with your children, with your job, we get weary, we get beat up, but don't let the devil rob from you that gratitude in your heart to the Lord who saved your soul. So there's the command for giving. Then point number two, and finally, <laughs> I never get to say that in point two. That felt really cool. All right. Uh, point number two uh, is the consolation of thanksgiving, okay? The consolation of thanksgiving. Now, look back at our text, verse 18. In everything give thanks. We've covered that. But look at the second part. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Now, here's the consolation to a thankful person. Letter A, when you are thankful, you are living in the will of God. Now, listen very carefully, because I believe the best counsel I can give is right here from this pulpit, from the Word of God. People ask all the time, how do you know God's will? You will never know God's will when there's an unthankful heart in your breast. You'll just not know it. In fact, more people tell me about, I put my name up on a job board. That's not how you find God's will. <laughs> you, want me just, you want me to just put my name out there on ChristianPost.com? Uh, you know, and I'm not going to get into dating sites here. <laughs> you know, that's a whole other story, right? But my goodness, folks. And why is it that sometimes when people are disgruntled, then and unthankful, that's when they go on their find God's will search. So here's my counsel to you. Get thankful where you are first. Get it settled. The Lord had to teach me that so many years ago when as a 15-year-old boy my parents moved to Korea. And I was so frustrated because I couldn't play football. I couldn't have a car. I had a girlfriend. I was sure we were going to get married by like age 16 probably. <laughs> and so instead of thinking, yeah, we're going to go serve the Lord in Korea, I got a poochie lip. And I, I wasn't thankful. And did you know what happened when we had a revival meeting 18 months or so into that experience? And I got thoroughly right with God. I got thankful because gratitude really is about your spiritual condition and here's what I learned your spiritual condition has nothing to do with where you live nothing to do with where you work and nothing to do with who you're married to it has everything to do with how deep your Christian life is because suddenly when I got right with God and learned how to give thanks kimchi tasted great Amen, Brother Phil, and it's tasted great ever since. Why? Because I got right with God. <laughs> That's a sermon right there, I'm telling you. <laughs> the consolation of a gratitude life is that you're much more likely to be in God's will when you're giving thanks. And, and almost every decision that any of you ever make because you're ticked off at work, ticked off at the neighbors, ticked off at California, frustrated with this, in a downer moment, is very likely right out of God's will because it is impossible to be unthankful and still be in God's will. And we see decisions all the times that are made from the basis of this lack of gratitude. And suddenly, yeah, that choir's great, but there's others, and this is a great church, but I'll find another one. And, you know, these are great, and, he's, and my husband's all right, but I'll get another one. 
That happens all the time, ladies and gentlemen. In everything give thanks. Why? This is the will of God for you. So knowing that all things fall into God's will is a comfort which some cannot enjoy unless they're giving thanks. And so Psalm 107 and verse 2, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. God says, I want you to just say how good I am. So living in God's will. How many of you would say being in God's will is a wonderful consolation for life? Uh, as a pastor, we, I've gone through ups and downs and we see victories and defeats and all these things. But I thank the Lord for the constant sense of knowing that I'm in His will. Before I ever begin a building program, we're studying this children's building, 17 Ways to None, trying to get the right budget, the right builder, all these different things, waiting for the funds to come in. But because I know this, that when we put the shovel in the ground, there's no looking back. So I want to know that I know that we studied, it's the time, it's the will of God. I want to stand up here and know that uh, as we go forward. And it's wonderful to, to know that you're in God's will. It's a wonderful way to live. And then secondly, you will not only live in God's will, but the second consolation is you will live in Christ's likeness. Now you say, well, why do you say that? Because I got to just tell you, one of my favorite services here is when we have the Lord's table. And we just do it, you know, five to seven times a year for our, for our church members. And when we gather together around the Lord's table, and I'm going to preach this coming Sunday morning about the Passover from Exodus in our study, Out of Bondage. But when we gather together and observe the Lord's table, one of the most meaningful parts of what Jesus said when he was, dis, uh, when he was distributing the, the elements, the, the wafer and the juice, Jesus said this, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Now just think of that. When he had given what? Thanks. I don't know about you, but if I knew that I was going to be kissed by Judas Iscariot shortly thereafter, and if I was going to be taken to Pontius Pilate, and if I was going to be scourged, and if I was going to be placed on an old rugged cross just hours after, I don't know that I'd be going, Father, thank you for what this represents. When he had given thanks. Yeah, but you don't know my boss, and you don't know my wife, and... You don't know about my old clunker I'm driving. Do you know about the cross? When he had given thanks, he was thankful for the symbol of his own death. So I submit to you that you are very Christ-like when in the difficult moments of life you are thankful to the Lord. It's living in his likeness. Paul the apostle who suffered was so thankful and teaches us in everything give thanks he teaches us that Jesus is the wellspring of our thanksgiving Jesus is the reason for our thanksgiving because no matter what happens we can give thanks to him we can be glad in the Lord the psalmist said in Psalm 100 enter into his thanks with into his gates with thanksgiving into his courts with praise and be thankful unto him and bless his name for the Lord is good his mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, 15, Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Let's say that together. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. I'm just telling you, the other guy at work might get the promotion and he might get a bonus or a raise, but no one can ever match the gift that God gave to you. It's unspeakable. And never forget that living with Christ and in his presence and in his likeness is the greatest reward of all, uh, living for Jesus, a life that is true, uh, trying to serve him in all that you do. Never forget that you're a child of the king. Never forget that your name is written down in the Lamb's book of life. Never forget that your sins are as far as the east is from the west. Never forget that you are accepted in the beloved. Never forget that you are called the friend of God. Never forget that you are a joint heir with God. Never forget that you have an inheritance reserved in heaven by God, just for you. This is all because of Jesus Christ. We are seated 
in the heavenlies even now positionally with him. Our grandson Chandler went to the doctor yesterday for his follow-up on his lungs. And he sat there in, in, the, in the little bench there and the doctor brought the blood pressure cuff and he started to tell Chandler, he said, this is to take your blood pressure and, you know, kind of like calming him down just a little bit. And uh, Chandler said, oh, I know about blood pressure. I was in the hospital a long time. He said, but you know the good news? They brought me pancakes to my bed. <laughs> and he said, my papa came and brought me presents. And this is why I know Chandler's going to be a preacher. Pancakes, papa, and presents. It's just that simple. <laughs> He's four years old. He has alliterated sermons to a nurse. Come on, folks, see it. It's already happening in his life. Now just think about that. They're trying to get him ready for a blood pressure cup, and he says, yeah, I, I know, I've been in the hospital a lot, but you want to know the good news? So I want you to say that with me tonight, but you want to know the good news. Ready? But you want to know the good news? Okay? Because we all, I mean, if you want to pull over and park, I can, I can give you a truckload of it tonight, of different things that we all face in life. But you want to know the good news? We're saved. We're on our way to heaven. I mean... The Word of God's in our hand, right? Uh, we live in America. Listen, there's a lot of good news. And I just want you to remember this next week or so to remember the good news. And uh, there's, uh, there's, there's a lot of it. There's a lot of it to remember and a lot of it to ponder. And I really believe it will make a difference. And uh, thank the Lord for pancakes, papa, and presents. Amen.